Greetings everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on a very interesting topic and that is women as doers in medieval India. This lecture would deal with the participation of women in the realms of imperial politics, religion, work, education, economy, etc. to show that women also played important roles in several walks of life and contributed for the continuation and development of culture the ge the general perception related to women is that it was only with the onset of the modern age with the coming in of modern a uh, system of administration english education a new system of education that women eventually came out of their homes and that they started participating in the public domain however if we look at the several sources that have so far remained untouched and unstudied we do find out that even in ancient and medieval times there were specific categories of women who were quite active so a woman's existence especially a woman belonging to royalty her existence was in no way marginalized even in medieval setup so 13th and 14th century india witnessed the emergence and consolidation of muslim rule political authority state structures and with that also started the process of participation for women in several walks of life we have a number of visual sources there are interesting dimensions that can be gauged from several visual images of women for example paintings they are one of the most important and unique source to provide a first hand information several paintings reflect social status of women contemporary customs dress lifestyle habits and also a glimpse of the overall composite culture indian paintings during 14th and 15th century flourished well in northern western and eastern india and we find several beautifully illustrated manuscripts at gujarat mandu jaunpur delhi etc and some very interesting examples uh, which can be described as folios uh, so there are paintings uh, that were kalpa sutra and kalakacharya katha from gujarat or a kalpa sutra painted at mandu or painted at jaunpur then there were folios from khamsa of amir khusro hamza nama from sikandar nama from lor chanda and from nimmat nama so in most of these uh, uh, visual representations uh, the focus was also on capturing the feminine form religion continued to be a very important domain for the female mystics during medieval india we see that women came forward participated in several mystic trends like sufism bhakti movement and they continued to play an important role as sufis as well as as the, as the mothers of leading sufis managing some very important khankas there were a number of ladies who were known for their piety religious outlook uh, for example we hear of bibi zulekha then bibi olia bibi karsum masuma bibi sharifa bibi sara etc and uh, a while there were a number of other names also that do exist uh, however a lot needs to be explored Uh, and the mentioned ladies had even developed spiritual prowess and they could perform even some acts of miracles that were very important for uh, the sufi uh, way of life then we can also consider 
illustration of several Persian classics. The tendency to illustrate the Persian classics, romances, story books, for example, the illustrated copy of the Hamza Nama, which deals with the romantic adventures of Amir Hamza, who was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad, belonging to late 15th century. Then a cursory examination of the miniatures also reveals that the Hamza Nama was written and it was illustrated for a bourgeois patron. Now while we are talking about medieval women, uh, the most important name that comes to one's mind is Razia Sultan. However, Razia Sultan is usually described as only the first female uh, you know, ruler of India dated 1236 to 1240 CE. The Delhi Sultanate was beset with numerous problems when Razia took over uh, the reins of the state and that is a far more important accomplishment of Razia rather than being described only as a female ruler. So, we have uh, scholars like Minhaj Us Siraj, who was a very distinguished alim, who remarked that Razia was endowed with all the important attributes and qualifications that were essential for ruler. Razia was not only an efficient ruler, but she was also a, matri a, a great patron of learning, uh, established a number of schools and libraries across northern India. Uh, she was even conferred the title of Alim Nawaz, that is a patron of scholars by leading religious scholar of the time. Maulana Minhaje, uh, Minhajus Siraj, uh, who is the author of 23 volume elaborate Islamic history book Tabakat e Nasiri that was completed in 1260. Now, Razia was quite conscious of her unique place in history, which no woman before her belonging to Sultanate. Uh, had enjoyed. So, she very proudly assumed the title of Sultan and it was during her reign that she ordered that even coins be minted with her title as pillar of women, queen of the times, Sultan Razia, daughter of Shamsuddin Iltutmish. Amir Khusro, a very renowned poet of Delhi, wrote in, 19, uh, in 13th century, uh, with a royal bow, she tore away the veil. The lioness showed so much force that brave men bent low before her. So that was the kind of authority she wielded and that was uh, the strength of her personality that she was compared to a lioness who just tore away the veil uh, behind which Muslim ladies were expected to lead their lives. Then another great achievement of Razia was the intellect. So she was not only a politically uh, accomplished woman, but also an intellectual ruler. And uh, she also stood for the encouragement of education during her regime. She patronized several men of letters. Uh, Minhaj was entrusted the task of supervision of Madrasai Nasiriya, which became a major center of learning during her period. Then uh, she also established several schools, academies, centers of research, public libraries uh, and these public libraries included several works of ancient uh, philosophers along with Quran as well as the traditions of Muhammad. Then besides these, then several Hindu works also in the realm of science, philosophy, astronomy, literature, etc. were studied in schools and colleges that were flourishing during her reign. The college that was located at Delhi was quite rich and magnificent uh, and it continued to impact the intellectual climate of those Times. Then another great achievement of Razia was in the sphere of coinage, which also kind of indicated the power she was wielding as an independent ruler. Uh, 
So, uh, they also reflected that how she did not consider herself to be a weak or a vulnerable uh, female ruler because her coins did not bear the name of her father alone or uh, neither they proclaimed Iltutmish as Sultan al Alam with Razia herself uh, being given uh, the subordinate title. So, these uh, coins uh, uh, while in the beginning uh, showed that Razia was at a, a, a lesser stage and she was probably you know uh, uh, ruling under the shadow of Iltutmish, but the style of the coins changed and by 1237-1238 when Razia alone was named on the coins, uh, this clearly showed that, uh, that this was the time when she was emancipated. So, Delhi and Lakhnauti were the chief mint names as were seen on the coins of Razia. However, with so much uh, 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 having accomplished so much and with so much to her credit, uh, we still find that uh, Razia was uh, buried and uh, her grave largely remained neglected. It lies among the narrow lanes of old Delhi, uh, a dilapidated black marble tomb standing some distance in the courtyard in Babule Khana inside Turkman Gate. And it lay crumbling and covered by dust and grime. And clearly, the grave shows that it has gone through several ravages of time and it is surrounded by residential buildings on all sides. So, that was the fate of such a strong and uh, highly uh, and a ruler of great caliber. Uh, then the next uh, uh, um, important uh, figure of Mughal royalty that one can talk about uh, is Zebun Nisa, the poet princess, daughter of Emperor Aurangzeb. Uh, Aurangzeb's eldest daughter, Zebun Nisa, was trained in the serious study of religious doctrine. She was known as an excellent scholar in several academic uh, disciplines and also as a literary figure and uh, uh, she had a, a name of her own in literary circles. She sang quite well, composed songs and also was known as a planter of gardens uh, in during her time. Her royal court was an academy known as Baitul Ulum, where scholars from every subject were busy composing and compiling books and they were encouraged in this task and they were also patronized by the princess herself. Most of the books were dedicated to her. She had a large collection in her library. Her Diwane Makfi contained 421 ghazals and penned the following books like Munis ul Ruh, Zebul Monshayat, and Zebul Tafasir. She wrote under the pen name of Makfi. The meaning of the Makfi is the hidden one. So, uh, in one of her uh, compositions, she wrote, I am an expert in things of love. Even the moth is my disciple. The nightingale would forget his song to the rose if he saw me walking in the garden. So, this lady had so much confidence that uh, she was, uh, uh, she did not mince words praising herself or praising her accomplishments. Then uh, in another writing, uh, uh, it goes like this. Uh, if the Brahmin saw my face, he would forget his idol. Whoever would find me must look in my words, for I am hidden in my words as the perfume in the petals of the flowers. So, these lines were also by Zebun Nisa Makfi. Then we can also talk about several other lesser known Mughal daughters. Most Delhi residents are familiar with the basic history of Red Fort, you know, the red sandstone monument that was built during the 17th century by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as the palace of his capital, 
Shahjahanabad. However, there are several other, uh, you know, uh, symbols which are important as far as uh, women belonging to royalty are concerned. But most of them were banished to the margins. There are very few mentions of the wives or concubines, female attendants and eunuchs. Once occupants of zenanas, that is the ladies quarters, they have now been banished to the margins of history and their contributions are considered as meager or inconsequential. So, our duty is to unearth such hidden uh, gems of knowledge and to explore and to question absence emits presence. There are several of Delhi's heritage monuments which featured powerful women. Humayu's tomb, which was the resting place of Emperor Humayu, was built by his wife Haji Begum. Then the famous Chandni Chowk market of Old Delhi was designed by Shah Jahan's daughter Jahan Ara. Then another very important contribution was that of Roshnara who was the second daughter of Shah Jahan, an influential woman in her father's court. After losing Mumtaz Mahal, Shah Jahan's daughter Jahan Ara and Roshnara, both these daughters, they rose to power and played a major role in the politics as well as religion and culture of those times. Along with making integral political and military decisions, she also masterminded the murder of her brother Dara Shiko to enable her favorite brother Aurangzeb to ascend the throne. Roshnara Garden in North Delhi is where she lived for a while and where her tomb lies today. While the gardens are well cared for, her tomb lies derelict and largely unattended. The spot is better known as the location of the elite Roshnara club founded by the British rather than as one belonging to this once important princess. Then Roshnara's sister Jahara too enjoyed a position of power and influence. She became the first lady of the court after her mother Mumtaz Mehal's death which was a rarity for daughters in the Mughal era. And there is a beautiful painting which captures this uh, moment, the passing of Shah Jahan beside his daughter Jahan Ara, a painting by Abhinindra Tagore that was uh, completed in 1902. It is believed that Shah Jahan consulted Jahan Ara on several political matters and favoured her over Roshnara. Her tomb in Nizamuddin is relatively unknown but has become a gathering spot for women hoping to be emotionally healed by her presence. So when we look at several of the visuals or when we visit some of these uh, neglected monuments, then we do give a thought to the important role that these ladies must have played during their times, but which has not adequately been studied or talked about. So, talking about Jaha Ara, upon her mother's untimely death during childbirth in 1631, the 17-year-old Jaha Ara inherited her mother's role as the head of the imperial harem. So, at such a young age, she kind of became so responsible. She also uh, was bestowed the royal seal and more physical power than any Mughal woman before her. Jaha Ara received a comprehensive education including Islamic theology as well as in Quranic studies. The most important uh, information that one can share uh, about Jaha Ara is the Sufi influence that was there on her.
her spiritual enlightenment, her education uh, and her Sufi uh, devout brother Dara Shiko uh, and uh, who himself was a prolific uh, mystical, mystic and he was always in the company of Sufis. All this kind of groomed her and uh, she herself was very fond of Sufi literature, especially the Tadkiras of holy saints. Uh, and uh, Jaha Ara had read a lot, uh, so many Tadkiras, which kind of also influenced her thought. So, as a mystic, in 1638, Dara Shiko initiated Jaha Ara's participation into the Sufi uh, Kadriyai or order under the guidance of Mullah Shah Badakshahi. She wrote books on Sufism titled Risalai Sahibiya and Muniz al Arwa. The Sahibiya is a spiritual narrative of the princess spiritual journey in the Qadiriya order of Sufism as well as a biographical sketch of her peer Mullah Shah Badakshahi. Muniz al Arwa is an anthology of the Chishtia and Kadriya saints and is uh, it also describes some extraordinary events of their lives. So, uh, the kind of spiritual authority that uh, Jaha Ara experienced and shared uh, needs far more uh, uh, focused study than has been done so far. Then uh, she was also a patron of uh, uh, scholars and uh, the title that uh, she uh, invoked was Rabia. So uh, she equalized the genders in their potential enlightenment on the Sufi path by saying that Rabia was indeed a good Sufi and equivalent to a hundred men. So, by doing so, she kind of elevated her status and also showed uh, the kind of confidence that she had. So, uh, a, a, a contemporary Mullah Shah said of her, she has attained such extraordinary uh, mystical knowledge that she is worthy of being my representative if she were not a woman. Then several of princesses can also be remembered as builders and uh, so for example, Jaha Ara was responsible for five of the 19 imperial buildings that were built in the city. She built Jama Masjid in Agra, Chandni Chowk, several homeless shelters, several caravan sarais, gardens, bazaars and she also owned a ship and her ship the Sahibi used to sail from the Indian port of Surat. And uh, as has been mentioned by Manuki, Jaha Ara was uh, not only a wealthy princess, but she was also uh, loved by all. Uh, she was allotted income from a number of villages and owned several gardens, including uh, Bage Jaha Ara, Bage Noor, and Bage Safa. So, here we see that uh, these Mughal princesses were kind of uh, important on their own, they had their own identity uh, and they could not merely be dismissed as belonging to Zenana or being part of Haram. Thank you.